really appreciate this time to share with all of you. I'm very encouraged right now as I'm looking through all the names and the faces on the Zoom call. And uh, I'm just so uh, encouraged to remember so many of you. And uh, somebody said in the chat that I wish we were all together because I would definitely love to catch up with each and every one of you. Uh, we love you. Uh, we miss you. We're praying for you. We're grateful for you. I was just thinking about uh, the last time we were in Los Angeles. Jennifer and I, we were in our 20s. You saw that picture of us. We were in our 20s. And, and now uh, we are heading into or in our 50s. So uh, a lot has changed since we were together. And I hope that that doesn't make you old timers feel, feel too old. Uh, but yes, we are moving on in life. And it's a good thing. Uh, but I'm very encouraged by this time to be able to, to share with you and encourage you. I've been invited to talk about Gideon and uh, your sermon series called and sent. And what a figure to look at and to study and to reflect on uh, with that theme in mind, uh, called and sent. Now, as a young person, uh, when I was uh, a child, my family was in Texas. Um, so I was born in Texas. Uh, my mom and dad were an interracial couple in 1970 in uh, Denton, Texas. And there was a uh, period of time that my, my mom and dad would try to find an apartment to live in, in Denton. And my mom would have to go to the, uh, to the landlord and rent the apartment. And then uh, sneak my dad, who's African American, in to uh, the apartment when the landlord wasn't present. And that went on for a while until the landlord found out um, that he was a black man and they would subsequently be evicted from their apartment. And that happened a number of different times to them at, in their young married life as newlyweds. Well, with all of the pressure that was on our family uh, to, to, and dealing with all the, the racial tension in Texas in 1970, and having a, a little uh, interracial uh, uh, brown baby boy, uh, my family, my mom, my dad, and my, two, my grandparents on my mother's side all collectively decided to move to California. They moved to California to try to find a space in the world somewhere where they could raise their family without the, the massive pressure of the racial tensions. Well, we ended up in California, Fullerton, California, where I grew up, and that's how, in one regard, I ended up, in the, in the long version of the story, ended up being connected with you in Lifeway, uh, being part of the old central uh, region of the Los Angeles Church of Christ. Um, but I am very grateful that we got out of there and we were able to get to California, and you might, you might refer to it as the migration to the, the Wild West. We were in the Southwest and we made our migration to the Wild West. We're looking in the book of Judges for our sermon today. And one of the best pictures to imagine yourself in when you read Judges is the Wild West. If there were a Wild West in the biblical narrative, it would be in the book of Judges. Growing up, I don't know what you were like, but growing up, I always played being a cowboy when I was a kid. We would play cowboys and Indians. Many of you grew up in the era that I did, and that was a, a thing we played outdoors with our friends, climbing trees and uh, wielding uh, dangerous weapons and, and, and going to combat against one another uh, and just having a good old time as kids. As a young boy, I always imagined myself being a cowboy. Right, because in the movies, the cowboys are the always the ones that are, they're, they're the ones always kind of on the winning side. But as I got older, I realized that in all likelihood in those stories, I, I most likely would have been one of the Indians and not one of the cowboys. And my appreciation for the Duke dropped off uh, fairly significantly. And for those kids out there who don't know who the Duke is, that's John Wayne. See, my interest and my appreciation for him was waning. Yeah, I appreciated that, that dad joke earlier about Noah. I'm, I'm kind of spreading the, the good 
dad jokes out there for you. And I'm just assuming you are all cracking up laughing right now because I can't hear any of you. From the beginning of the story of Judges, it was a gruesome and bloody endeavor. In much the same way that a lot of those Wild West stories, the true versions of them were, were very chaotic and troublesome. The story of Judges in many ways begins in a kind of a chaotic and a disruptive uh, atmosphere as the people of Israel come into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, but then they're now in this land with people groups and tribes all around them vying for the same exact space that they're seeking to occupy. And I want to just look, you can open up to the book of Judges. We're going to stay in the book of Judges the entire sermon. Um, I'm going to read a few selections from uh, the book of Judges, and then we're going to go to the text about Gideon in chapter six, where we'll spend the majority of our time. But I'm going to just read a few passages here from Judges to set the scene. In Judges chapter one, verse four, uh, we see uh, the episode where the king of the Canaanites was captured. And it says there, when Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men of Bezek. It was there that they found Adoni Bezek and fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanites and Perizzites. Adoni Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him, and they cut off his thumbs and big toes. Viewer discretion is advised if you're going to read the book of Judges. It is quite a bloody affair. As a matter of fact, if this was in visual form, there's no way that it would have to be rated R. It's just, it's gruesome. Now, imagine no thumbs. What would that be like? It was an act of humiliating the king and disempowering him from being able to engage in warfare you know, along with his toes. So the whole story of the book of Judges starts off in this kind of, this, this bloody attack on the Canaanites and this kind of chopping of the body of their king. And then when you go all the way to the end of Judges in Judges 19 through 21, we see an, an episode that really is a very delicate episode that I'm, I'm even hesitant in some regards to share in a mixed audience because of how I mean, unbelievable it really is. But a Levite's concubine in this section of Judges is brutally victimized by a group of men from the Benjaminites and voluntarily is given up by her master in that way. The details of the account are so terrible, I don't feel comfortable sharing them in an open audience. But it was an awful, awful scene. In a rage, this Levite uh, took the body of his deceased concubine, his wife, and cut her into 12 pieces, took those 12 pieces and sent them out to the 12 tribes of Israel. And this event sparked the beginning of a civil war between the rest of the Israelite tribes and the Benjamites. Again, it was was kind of terrible times. So why am I painting this picture? I'm just trying to give you the, paint the scene of this book. From Judges 1 to Judges 21, there's just a kind of a downward spiral of of violence and turmoil and disruption and trouble that really kind of ends this book in a lot of ways with a feeling of kind of chaos and destabilization. The first verse in this episode we just read about, about the concubine, in verse 19, chapter 19, verse 1, it says, in those days, Israel had no king. In the final verse of the book of Judges, In Judges 21, verse 25, it says, In those days, Israel had no king. Each person did what they considered to be right. This is the atmosphere. Each person was a law unto themselves. Again, imagine that wild, wild west kind of gunslinger type of atmosphere. You know, think about the comic books and the anti-heroes that we often revere, watch movies about, and look to. And these are some kind of tough people. The gunslinger imagery is very fitting for the book of Judges. We have Ehud, uh, one of the early judges who's an adept left-handed assassin with a specially crafted double-edged sword 
that he plunges into the belly of King Eglon. Again, details too much to share. Jael, the fair and faithful Israelite maiden, armed with a clever intellect and a tent peg for the forehead of Sisera, the commander of the Canaanite armies. And then we have Samson, who is this man, manly man of all men. And he attacks the Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And to me, as I read it, it seems that he almost does it just for the fun and the sport of it. What a messy and brutal business Samson is in, going around with a, a jawbone, literally beating people to death. Again, sorry for the, I mean, you asked me to teach on judges, please forgive me, but this is what we're looking at. This is what it's, this is what we're in when we read judges. Now, why do we have to take all this into consideration when we think about Gideon? Well, we have to keep it into consideration because Gideon, we see him as a kind of an, a fearful, cowardly type of figure, but we have to we have to put him in this right context and imagine his scenario so that we don't judge him too harshly, right? Marvel com com comics and gunslinger movies and all those things, they seem really exciting when you're watching them in a movie, but can you imagine actually living in those stories? I don't know about you, but I know I would be much more like Gideon than I would Ehud. You know, kind of Ehud just seems to be the take charge and go get him kind of guy that we see in the, in the typical kind of gunslinger uh, mode. But, but I believe truly, I would connect much more with the experience of a Gideon in real life. You know, the poet uh, William Butler Yeats is an Irish poet of the uh, early uh, 20th century. He wrote a poem at the end of fir the First World War and um, at, also at the beginning of his wife's sickness during a, a flu pandemic in 1919. Um, I thought we could relate to somebody who's in the middle of a pandemic writing his thoughts down. Uh, but Yeats writes this poem called The Second Coming. And there are some lines from the poem I think that are apropos to, I think, a Gideon situation and in some regards to ours as well. The, a line from the poem goes like this. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed. And everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. It's all a bit dark. It's all a bit treacherous and difficult to deal with. But it is really the situation they're in. I think about, it's kind of like the Empire Strikes Back rated R version. You know, the movie starts off with our hero, Luke, almost dying right at the very beginning of scenes of the movie. And the end doesn't seem to be much better for those Star Wars fans out there. Strangely enough, for me, it happens to be my favorite Star Wars movie. Why? I don't know. I just, I love the tension in that movie and the difficulties and the, the training and the challenges that the characters are going through. And I can, I guess I can relate with it. But as we take this a closer look at Gideon, this context helps us to understand why he was so timid, why he was struggling with courage the way that he was. You know, if I was to give this sermon a title other than called and sent, I would call it Gideon, the Courageous Coward. In the trailer voice, we need a, we need a voiceover person here to, to, to read this, but in a time and place when everyone is a law unto themselves and things are literally a bloody mess, an unlikely hero emerges. You know, in the chapter just before chapter six of Judges, Judges chapter five, Deborah is the hero, the judge in that story. And in chapter five, Deborah unleashes this song. It's a poem and a song, like a psalm, where she's singing about the victories uh, that she has had as the judge of Israel. And I imagine in my head, uh, this is almost like a rap battle. Those of you who know rap sampling, I hear the, the sample to uh, like Apache uh, in, in, my, in the back of my head and Deborah singing this song. And she's basically saying in the song, all y'all 
like princes and rulers and, and all you cool people who were supposed to handle your business in Israel, you were chilling. You were doing nothing. And, and it was me and it was Jael with her tent peg who stepped up to the, the, the challenge. And we took on, took on the, the evil powers that were against us. And I can just see, I can just see Deborah doing this drop. It's a, it's a total mic drop. It is. Okay. If I could sing a rap, I would try to do a version of it for you. I put that on the creative people in the room, but she drops the mic. And really interestingly, just after this, we see Gideon, we see Gideon, who is the next would be judge, the next reluctant judge. And what is he doing? He's actually doing a lot of the things that the men in Deborah's story were doing. They're hiding. They're sticking by back in the, in the backdrop. They're doing their jobs. They're at leisure doing things that they were normally doing. And Gideon is in a similar situation. I can actually see Deborah calling out Gideon. I had a friend um, in uh, the early days of the LA church and her name was Deborah. Okay. And uh, I, I, I like to, like when I hear Deborah rapping, sometimes I like to think that's Deborah. She's, she's, she's breaking out the, the mic drop on, on Gideon right now. And so Gideon, he's really, he's a, he's a big scaredy cat. He is. But we have to remember his context. We all want to be that guy or that woman who steps up to the plate. But we have much more to relate to in Gideon's story than that guy or that woman. Midian is the, the latest oppressor, and their tactic is to try to starve, starve out the land of Israel. In Judges chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Judges chapter 6. We're going to stay here for the remainder of the, the sermon. Uh, Judges chapter 6 and verse 4, it says here, They invaded the land and devoured its crops all the way to Gaza. They left nothing for the Israelites to eat, and they took away the sheep, oxen, and donkeys. When they invaded with their cattle and tents, they were as thick as locusts. Neither they nor their camels could be counted. They came to devour the land. Israel was so severely weakened by Midian that the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. So their fear and their anxiety is, is a, it's a real situation. You know, sometimes when we see people acting afraid of something and we don't understand their context, it's easy for us to say, well, what, what is there to be afraid of? Just do this. And some of us may read the story of Gideon and think, well, what are you afraid of? You know, God's on your side. Just do this. But we have to try to drop back and bathe in his atmosphere a little bit more so that we can appreciate the challenge that was before him. In Judges chapter 6, verse 11, it says here, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep, to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So this angel, this messenger comes to talk to Gideon. And some of the first words out of his mouth are, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon objects in Judges 6.13. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? You know, when you're going through tough times, a lot of times it's easy to ask, why, why is all this happening? God, where are you? And I, and I think it's, it's okay. God can handle us asking him this question just as Gideon did. So ask, please ask. Have the courage to admit your fears and tell God, hey, I don't know if I'm ready to step into this next challenge. Please, God, help me understand what's going on. And then in verse 13, verse 14, we have God's response. God says, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? You see, there's a lot going on in our world today. I don't know if you've paid attention, but there's quite a lot of turmoil that we're going through. And I have personally, and I'll share this a little bit later in our, in our forum, uh, but I have personally gone through a number of ups and downs 
as we have gone through, especially some of the racial tensions that are going on in our world today. And I, I've been asked to do things like this, to do forums. I've been called by my friends to help in different situations. And honestly, a lot of times when they are, they're calling me, I'm thinking, why are you calling me? I'm struggling too. I don't know what to do. You know, and what's really great is when my friends do call and I just tell them that, you know what? I'm struggling too and I don't know what to do. We can pray together and sort out a way with each other. There's nothing like vulnerability, um, as Lim's talked about earlier, to really help us to understand our future together. But as we go through those things, we just got to remember to hold on to the Lord and he'll help us go in the strength that we have. Now, that's the point of this. God is not asking us to go with somebody else's strength. He's not inviting us to go on a mission that is above our pay grade, you might say. He meets us right where we're at. He met Gideon. Where did he meet Gideon? He didn't meet Gideon in the battlefield. He met Gideon in the wine press. He met Gideon in his hiding place. And I am confident that God's been coming to you in your hiding place and having those conversations with you to draw you out into mission, to draw upon your heart from where you are, to go in the strength that you have right now. Right now, you don't have to go climb the heights spiritually. You don't have to attend seminary. You don't need to take that class, although all those things are good. God is meeting you where you're at right now, whether it's the wine press, your cave, your hiding place. Mine just happens to be my office where I go hide away from all the trouble that's going on in the world. So Gideon continues to object, just as I believe, honestly, we would. He says, but hold on, Lord, how am I going to do this? In verse 15, just look, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my family. The Lord replied to him and said, and I love this in the New English translation, they translate this as, ah, but I will be with you. You will strike down the whole Midianite army. And I can just see God going, ah, ah, that's nothing. I, I, I've got you, Gideon. Don't worry about it. I am on your side. I am with you. And I think if we, no matter our clan, no matter our tribe, no matter our race, no matter our gender, our age, our affiliations, no matter what traumas we've been through, no matter what upbringing we've had, no matter what disabilities we come to the table with, no matter what our limitations, God is able to meet us where we, at, we are at, meet all of our objections and say, as he did to Gideon, ah, James, don't you understand? All you need is me. I'm with you. I've got you. Let's go. Go in the strength that you have. I love, I love this so much. Gideon is, then goes on to ask for a, a sign and God gives him the sign. And, you know, he gets this sign of, of this burnt offering. Uh, the angel touches with his staff. And then he sheepishly goes out to his first mission in Judges 6, 25, verse 32. And I'm going to read this and we're going to close here on this passage because a lot of times we look at the 300 taking out the Midianites, conquering the land and winning the victory finally. But there is such a vital step before all of that happens here in Judges 6, 25. I think it's helpful for us to stop and see this beginning stage of, of of, of his trust, of Gideon's trust in God, stepping out in his fear still, but doing what God is calling him to. You know that in uh, chapter 6, verse 25, it says, that same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord, your God on the top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. And so Gideon went on and he did that, but he did it with his entourage of 10 servants and he did it at night. And it says, because he was afraid, he was afraid still, but he said, 
let me go. God is showing me that he's supporting me. I'm going to go out in the strength I have and try to do God's will. Well, we all know the rest of Gideon's story fairly well. He asks for more tests and God gives him those, those uh, answers, the, the fleecing that we talk about. But then God turns around and tests Gideon back and challenges him to go into the battle with only 300 men. I find it really instructive and interesting that after all of this, after all, after, and I love this first initial kind of test to see if God would satisfy his promises to Gideon, and he did. He did, and I think Gideon gained some measured confidence from that, because in the next scene, he's beginning his battle against Midian. And he seems to have become a different kind of person here. He seems to have been transformed. And we look at him and we're almost, if you compare the Gideon from, from the beginning of the story to the Gideon here, you'd almost feel like you're looking at two different people. And I believe if we go in the strength we have and we step out and encourage, God will begin that transforming work in our hearts so that we can accomplish his mission in this world. I love Judges chapter 7 verse 17, because it's just so striking compared to his, his cowardly nature to, to hear him speak and lead God's people the way that he does here. In Judges uh, 7, 17, it says, watch me, Gideon speaking. He told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. This is that weak, sad, lonely kind of guy that at the beginning that just didn't even want to take the first steps. But here he is courageously leading. Gideon went from being a coward to being courageous. And I want to encourage all of us, we don't have to take that big step, but let's with Gideon take those first few steps toward courage as we're being called to our mission and being sent. Thank you. 